very small classes, four, five, ten people. Um, religion isn't necessarily a hot topic. Um, and, and then I started to open up and redefine my understanding of religion, spirituality, and how it relates to society. And then I would start to contact different members of the faculty where I taught, and then I would start contacting different other departments at the university, and then I would start to contact other universities. University of Montreal, Concordia, um, I mean all of them. I believe that we, education is open-ended. So many of the people, what happened is I, I was in a little room at the beginning, and by the end of my teaching, we had to have an amphitheater for every course because all the other professors were coming. The anthropologists were coming, the sociologists were coming, the historians were coming. Um, to say nothing, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw all the people there. The, the Deputy Secretary of the United Nations was twice my guest. So all the other profs want to be part of that too. And they all want to hear Paul Martin. I mean, when are you going to sit down and talk with the Prime Minister? Or, or, or Lucien Bouchard? Everybody wants to get in on the act. Is it because their, their response to, or their reaction to what it is that you're doing is somewhat positive? I imagine? Would that be safe? Well, it, 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 they participated willingly. In fact, they, they would even come in on their own. But it's very clear uh, that, you know, my motto in education is that of the New York Times. Everything that's fit to print. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I believe a university exists to tackle the tough issues. If we can't talk about the tough issues here, where in the world can we? Now when you start tackling those tough issues, fasten your seatbelts. Um, he's asking me if I ever felt the administration was ready to knock on my door. Um, <laughs> I mean, ce n'était pas un secret que ça se brassait dans mes cours. Um, I'm sort of like Jerry Lee Lewis in a classroom, all shook up. People got all shook up. So yeah, it did shake people up. Yeah, and I would hear echoes, you know, sort of like, <clears throat> I, I, I think the best is a film analogy here. Do you, do you know Star Wars? It was almost like Darth Vader coming to me and saying to me, the emperor is not as forgiving as I am. <laughs> I was, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, perhaps the, the other two panelists, what it was like to be a participant in mm -hmm. Dr. Kermet's class and, and how were your experiences as a participant? Um, I had seen Dr. Cornette for several years walking the halls of galleries, Belgo building, and he was this eminence that would walk around and he stood out and I didn't know who he was and slowly got to know him, talked a few times, and uh, at some point he uh, asked me if I wanted to participate in one of the sessions. And as an artist at the time of having, maybe I'd been 30 years of career at that point, or 35 years, I had been invited for numerous lectures, artist presentations, I'd been a teacher for 30 some odd years, so I was experienced in that kind of field. So I said yes, and I said, what are the ground rules? is that basically we'll mobilize the gallery and I'll need permission from the gallery, which I'll take care of, and then my students will go there. And it was at La Galerie d'Arboutremont. He organized it there, and I just want to give you the sense of how it worked. Uh, he mobilized the gallery for two hours, and his students were brought into the gallery for two hours, and they were asked to sit down and write. I wasn't there. They just sat and wrote. At 
later period, I walked into his classroom, and the room was a bit was smaller than this, and the entire room was covered with drawings that the students had done of my work. First that. And we have no fine art students so where I taught. Pencil <laughs> drawings on uh, recycled paper. And there was a brief introduction. And I think the most striking first thing that came to mind, comes to mind is when he said, are there any questions? If there were 60 students in the room, 59 hands went up. <laughs> That's never happened to me before. The ratio is usually 5%. And then he chose one which I couldn't believe. I didn't know this thing about names. <laughs> so I couldn't believe this. So first of all, I'm off, thrown off by a, a kind of character name. And then the student responded. And then the next thing, he starts reading something quite powerful and intimate, which I, he's got, I notice he's got a stack of paper. And then he tells me afterwards, these are things that the students have been writing. So then we go on like this for a solid two hours. And it's probably been the most intense two hours of visiting artists I've ever done in my life. Because it didn't let up. And each question was heartfelt. And each question had me thinking of what it meant and what it was. So I walked out of there feeling quite engaged. And it ranged from what they had seen, curiosity of what I did, their interpretation of what they thought I did, and it didn't get into where I went to school, what I ate for breakfast. It was really about their experience at the time. And it was unique. And it then made me feel like this was quite... And this was not too long before the film came out, the incident that McGill on the film. Came out. So then I got to know the bigger picture. There's a bounce one. <coughs> I was every year, once or twice a year, I guess, in the Dr. Kunitz um, class. And it was always because the students had watched one of the films I had made, and like you say, they had written uh, their thoughts about it. So uh, it was interesting each time, but one time was more than interesting. <laughs> I was really roasted. I was sitting at the front, and he started to read all the uh, things that the students had read. And this particular film was a film on uh, homeless people, our own people, here in Montreal. And it's called No Address. So it comes to one uh, reading, and the reading says uh, something like, uh, I can't stand watching you uh, when I'm walking on the street. Uh, here you are begging, and uh, you're... Um, nuisance uh, to people and why don't you get off your ass and get to work and uh, I always have to cross the street when I see you and you're sitting on the sidewalk and you just went on and on and, and you're lazy and uh, and I hearing it it was even worse than what I'm saying because I don't remember all the words and hearing the sound and you know how he reads the actor was very uh, uh, difficult here and I started to cry and I couldn't stop crying to save my life. <laughs> it was just terrible. And um, so I told the students that I was happy to be in that classroom. My tears were just tears and you know they come and they go. And um, I know that people think like that about our people. I have lived it, I'm aware of it, especially people who are on the street and uh, go through hard times. For other people, it disturbs them in a lot of ways. And I was glad that I was there talking with the students because to remind them that uh, that can happen to anybody to end up in that kind of uh, life, feeling lost and feeling um, that you don't belong. And you're, here you are begging, and you're at the lowest part of your life. And what hurt me the most is why do you want to kick someone?
somebody's got nothing and um, how can you be so cruel? And so I said to them that you know, surely someday some of these students are going to be leaders of our country or we'll, have, we'll be some place with very high um, position where they control, where they can permit or where they can stop things. Or, and I said, I hope that you won't be so severe in your judgment about people, no matter what nationality they are or no matter how poor they are. And it was very good because um, I could dialogue with the students and you know, some of them answered and said what they thought. But after that, every time I went back, I felt that I had such a good relation with those students. It was practically always the same one. And I met them on the street. It, there was something enriching for me. I felt that somehow, having had this um, happening, that I dare think that it would be different about that subject. So it was very difficult, <laughs> but um, it was enriching, I think, for me and for the students that were there. Other questions? Bonne question. Um, <coughs> she's asking me, do I know of other people who teach in this dialogic philosophy of education? I personally do not. Um, in fact, this is part of the continuum. It took 15 years of, I basically consider the, the, the classroom to be a laboratory of learning. So I keep conducting experiments. Mais, je devrais dire aussi, il y a, vous le savez ici, il y a d'excellents profs partout. Alors, il s'agit de gravité vers ceux, celles qui vraiment vous permet de vous épanouir en tant qu'être humain, en tant qu'étudiante. That's a, a very fair question. Hey, what did Abraham Lincoln say? <laughs> that, you know, you can't please all of the people all of the time. Of course, in every single class. The difference is that my classes were all electives. So you never had to be there. If you didn't want to be there, if, you know, what's the expression? If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. You always had the option to get out of the kitchen. But yes, you're quite right. Um, there were people who thought it was going to be a bird course and they were going to get an automatic A. The first two weeks, and, and uh, um, shout, uh, shout out to Public Housing and Nine Lives can tell you this, the first two weeks are the university's version of boot camp. It's survival of the fittest. And then s some people, they stay thinking, okay, it's going to get better after the two weeks. We just ratchet up the intensity. You know, when you invite people like the Prime Minister of Canada or the Justice of the Supreme Court of, Can uh, of Canada, the Supreme, you can't bring them in there if you haven't done your homework. That's a, 
First of all, I never take no for an answer. And I just keep calling <laughs> until they say yes. Um, and I did not know Ms. Obama so when, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to understand some of the tensions right here in Montreal, in Quebec, you know, I started to feel uncomfortable as a scholar. It was like we were teaching about the abstract aboriginal. Now, wait a cotton pick and make it. These people don't live in another galaxy far, far away. The Oka crisis happened just minutes from the campus. So I said, who can I find who can really help us to understand it? If you have not seen Ms. Obamsuin's film, Rocks at Whiskey Trench, it is required viewing. When I saw, I was actually in Berkeley, and the Oka crisis came down. And I was with family and friends, and I said, how could this happen in Canada? Canada's peaceful. Canada's neutral. It's all love and kisses in Canada. <laughs> and, and so I wanted to understand what was happening. So I come back, and I said, I gotta, you know, I gotta find out what's coming down. I said, how could I do this? So I started to do a filmography of the films of Alain Sobamsuin. And when I saw Rocks of Whiskey, Rocks of Whiskey Trench, I said, I've got to do something about this. And so I contacted her. And each time I invite someone, whether it's the Prime Minister or whether it's uh, Branford Marsalis, he won three Os he won three Grammys before the guy was 40 years old. I went up to Branford Marsalis at the Jazz Festival, just the way I go up to Lucien Bouchard. Have you got game? You want to experience something you never have in your entire life. And Branford Marsalis really does have game. You know, he was intrigued by this. And I, I'll have to tell you what, when he did come in, because we did the same thing. There are, there are no exceptions. It doesn't matter if you want one of the greatest musicians on the planet jazz. So I had everybody, re and this was after. This is one during uh, dialogic sessions. After I'd finished teaching university, I was no longer there. I invited him. He came, and we had been listening to his music blindfolded. They did not know it was Branford Marsalis. They didn't know the title of the album. They didn't know the name of the track. They knew nothing. All they knew is they were hearing music blindfolded. Then I, they take off the blindfolds, turn on the lights, write everything you experience. And then... A couple of weeks later, all of a sudden, Branford Marsalis walks in the room, and there are no exceptions. And so he, he wrote a song called The Long Goodbye, and he's sitting right next to me. I said, Mr. Marsalis, we call these adventures in honesty. So I would like to ask you to please relax, and I'm going to read how one person experienced your song, The Last Goodbye. Now I'm quoting here verbally. The person wrote verbatim, who's the big prick with a shiny sax and a monstrous ego. And I read this to Branford Marsala sitting next to me. His jaw drops. Nobody talks to Branford Marsalis like that. And the guy's an athlete. I mean, this guy's in shape. You know, he was he was the house band for for um, um, Jay Leno. He he toured with Sting. You know, the Blue Turtles and all this. Nobody ever talks to him like that. And there was absolute silence. Everybody was afraid. And I realized to take it to the next level, we had to break. Believe it or not, the anonymity. But I couldn't break it. So I asked the person who wrote this, would they please identify themselves? And we have music critics, we had journalists, we, we had photographers from the jazz festival in the room. So Branford Marsalis is, this is big. You know, and all these people are watching. And finally, this little girl raises her hand. <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> And then Marsalis looks at her and he says, well, why'd you write it? That broke the ice. We didn't have to beat around the bush of political correctness anymore. We could talk turkey. 
From that moment on, Mar Branford Marsalis would not stop dialoguing. Everybody started talking about creativity, composition, and music. His manager had given me a life threat. If I didn't get him back to the press room by 3.30, I would pay for it. 3.30, Branford Marsalis says, I ain't leaving. <laughs> So I have to finally, at 4 o'clock, drag him down to the press room. And all, as we're on the way down, Branford Marcello says, very much like Professor Morelli, never in my life have I experienced my art in this way. And so he says, I got I to gotta speak to Spike about this. Spike being Spike Lee, the filmmaker, because he, he writes music for it. For uh, Brentford Marcellus writes music for Spike Lee. Uh, for example, in Malcolm X, he does some of the special pieces. And as we're going down, he says, Okay, we're going to talk about this more at the concert tonight. I said, Mr. Marcellus, the concert's sold out. I, I, I won't get to be there. Uh uh. <laughs> Gets on his cell, calls his handler, get him a, a place. We go to Place des Arts that night, it's packed. And there are a lot of people who had been in, in, in the dialogic session who were in the audience. Bradford Marsalis is cooking on his alto sax, and then on his soprano. And then he comes to a song in the set. And he goes to the mic, and he says, this song used to be called The Last Goodbye. I now title it. My big ass, shiny sacks. <laughs> he tells the whole audience this. Joshua Redmond, because he actually got me a place right behind the, the curtain. <laughs> so I'm sitting right behind the curtain. Joshua Redmond, one of the greatest of the saxophonists, um, and then Kenny Werner, Grammy winner, has also been my dialogue partner. When he finishes the song, he makes a beeline straight to me with his soprano sax hanging from his neck. He says, Professor Cornette, you go back and you tell him I take them seriously. I, I hate to call this close, but I think that's a, a beautiful way of, of, of ending this session. Uh, unless either of you have anything else to add, but I want to thank uh, Fofo, I want to thank the two speakers, I think it's a great opportunity to have this in the three years in the making, and I think it's finally happened, and welcome this film to Concordia, and thank you so much, Dr. Cornett, and thank you, Ms. Spencer. Thank you. Dialogic sessions continue, like with Branford Marsal, Gérald Bouchard, who was our guest recently. If you'd like to be part of it, they never cost more than $5. That's the agreement. So if you want to meet these people in person and sit down and dialogue with them, please write very clearly your name, your email address in large, legible, and please also your phone number, because even when I ask to write large and legible, there's always emails that I can't make out. It'll be right here on the board. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, folks. Thank you.